I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and as always, I'm thrilled you're here. Uh, you know, I don't even know where to go with this. I've been so excited to have this gentleman on the show. You all love Barney people, and I've got one of my favorites on this week. And a little different direction here. I've known him for a long time. I'm so excited. This is, and I'm going to say Bruce Harmon, but everyone knows him as Bouvet. He was a camera operator on the show. He's still a camera operator. He's done so much different stuff. Bouvet, how are you? Carrie, it's funny. I picked up my my little plush and I hit the button and I heard Bob West. And I was like, I haven't heard his voice in years. This <laughs> usually just sits down in our office on a couch. And also I, I heard, hello again to all my friends. And I was like, oh my God, it's Bob. So you had no anyway, idea you had Bob right there with you. And I was sitting right behind me. He's all, he's doing all right. There we go, Bob. Yeah, so everything's great, man. It's um, really glad to join you on this. I'm looking forward to seeing how you're going to pick my brain. <laughs> no, I just, you know, it, it's so interesting. You don't know this, but your name's been brought up on this show many times. Oh. Um, because we talk a lot about what a family this was and how we all exactly. work together and all those aspects of it. And I always mm -hmm. tell the story about, I, I can't remember exactly when it was, but we were doing Barney and Friends. And there was a, a day, I don't know, I'm looking somewhere, and you actually got down and were pointing, you were giving me camera directions. <laughs> yeah, I did that a lot. <laughs> I know you did, and I was telling that story to Josh Martin. He's like, oh yeah, oh, Bouvet, yeah. Used to, Bouvet used to do that for me too. I did it for everyone, I think, even with Joiner, I think I would do the, because you know, you guys, I'd have to go down. <laughs> So you could see out of your mouth and right. I'd be like, I'd be like, open up because you're like blocking. And then you guys would totally just go do, 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 and just block yourselves. <laughs> I think I did that with all the kids too. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, because we had such great performance directors, Penny, and right. um, she was so good with the kids, but there was so much going on sometimes and you'd be shooting a scene and, um, You'd go, oh, they got to open up. They're, everyone's got their, they're all sideways. We're getting profiles and everything else. And so while they're over there in between um, takes, production and directors and such, I just walk up to everybody and go, here's what you need to do. Open up a little bit this way because you need to move this way because I'm shooting camera one, shooting this, camera two, shooting this, camera three, shooting this, and you're blocking. They go, okay. And next thing you know, we do the scene and it would look great. And I'd go, oh. <laughs> it wasn't just me. I mean, the other guys on the floor too, and gals would notice the same thing, but it was like, it was funny how you, <laughs> that's the funniest thing you recalled is that I used to get down there and go, yeah, open up a little bit. Oh, you guys I, were so cool about it. I remember it so well because, you know, when I came on, I'd been doing it, the care, I've been playing Bernie for a long time. Yeah. TV was totally new to me. Yeah. And that set's huge. And, you know, they always tell you, you know, working with kids and animals and costumes huh. and, oh my, you know, all the things going on. Yeah. And a lot of times you're so concerned about the perform, you know, the performance. I've mentioned this before, you know, the, the dinos couldn't get mistakes because the kids, right? You know, if, if they get one right, if they get it right, the last thing I want is to be blamed on me. So exactly. Like, or us too, things. as the camera people and, you know, misframing something and we're trying to dolly back and forth on the set to get to the next shot and we're a little late or we trip on a cable. And you're right. It would be like, you guys had the most stress because just trying to get the kids to get one or two scenes right. And, you know, sometimes we'd be 16, 17 takes in. Right. And I, for you all and, and you know, in those suits it would just be like oh my god i felt for you it it was one of the coolest things that 
all of you. I mean, I always felt every aspect of the crew, everyone was helping everyone out. And there was yeah. aspects of that because you guys aren't just just shooting this. You're watching what's going, as you just said, you're listening to what's going on, what needs to be done, all those aspects. Well, yeah. And in, in starting at Series 100, um, I remember because we did get a lot of swag, you know, Barney swag. And one of the first T-shirts we had was Bar Barney Team or Team Barney or whatever. And it was like, so right away, you felt like you were part of a team. So you had that. Um, it wasn't like, nope, you do your job, you do your job, you do your job, we'll direct and produce this. And that's the way it runs. No, it would be, hey, if you had any input, hey, what if, if we blocked it a little differently this way or, um, you know, anything. And we'd have to notice as camera people, if you noticed them, you know, it was hard doing moves on the sets and, and trying to frame stuff so you want to shoot off set or, um, and, and show things or even sometimes when they would block something and you go, well, the blocking's not going to work because we can't shoot around the set. We can only, the parameter, we can only go to this point and we can't go any further left. Even if we took the gym out way left, we can't shoot back across because there's no set over here. Right. So we'd have to work with um, performance and you know the director and, and, and do things like that, which was so cool that we had a voice. Um, and we'd have to look out for a lot of things, just continuity type stuff, where even though we had continuity people, there's so many props and there's so many things and things are being picked up and moved, picked up and moved as far as props and then wardrobe with the little things off here and there and you're shooting multiple set scenes um, or takes, sorry. Uh, you would go, oh, wait, wait, wait. And you know, you can see that something's a little off and you would go and they go, ah, and wardrobe would have to come in and readjust this or that. Um, so we were, it was amazing how much we were part of the team. And it was just uh, phenomenal that I even got on the show to begin with, um, to work on it, so. Well, that's a, that's a good place to start here. Because, and I remember this, and I didn't mention this a second ago, we were talking, but did you do some acting at one point? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What I thought. Yeah, I did. I mean, I grew up acting and singing, and um, pretty much from when I was a little kid, I could sing. And so that grew into junior high, did a lot of acting, high school, college. I went to TCU as an opera theater major for singing and acting and um so but i also wanted to get into um television i wanted to be kind of on air i wasn't sure if i want to be it you never know what you're going to be when you're 18 years old right? right um so i went to school and after a year i was like oh, i'm burnt out on this i don't want to be an actor or a singer because that's all i did for the last 10 years of my life some people have the chutzpah to get through it and i was like nah so i got into a, um, a summer job working for a production company remote facility company out of arlington started doing sports never thought in a million years that's what i do but i had a great job and then that continued and i was going to college and then i drop out for a semester because i was making like 100 bucks a day or whatever <laughs> back then um <laughs> But it was your big money. I'm like, why am I going to college when I'm making this money? And I just left the whole acting thing behind. I always sang and I still sing. Um, and then in 1985 or six, I went back to college one more year because I said, why not give it a shot? So I went to the small school, Graceland University in Iowa and got dove right back into singing, acting, um, and we did this, um, so I did a lot of shows and we did this one act play, but well, we went to New York and there was this, oh, there must've been 50 colleges from around the country and it was off, 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 off Broadway. And we we're in this theater. And so we went in and did our, um, it was like a 25 minute play or something. And I caught the bug back and I went, okay, I got to give this a shot. So I talked to my folks and I said, I want to move to New York and try this acting thing. They said, 
okay. And I had money saved up from jobs and such, and they helped me out a bit. So I moved to New York for a year and went to acting classes, met a bunch of people, some famous folks that I'm not going to mention on here, but in their youth, really known actors now, we were in acting class together. It's pretty cool. And um, auditioned for plays, musicals, Broadway, um, commercials. And so, oops, so, the, so the funniest thing was, so I said, I gave myself a year. And if I don't make it in a year, I'm going to move back to Texas and get back and try to get back in the TV thing. So I had auditioned for this AT&T commercial like three times. And I was leaving on like May 15th. And I got a call back on May 14th and said, we want you to do this commercial. And I said, nope, I'm moving. So I left and I had the gig. And a guy that from my acting class got this national AT&T commercial might have changed my life. But honestly, I looked at it like, nope, this wasn't meant for me. You know, move on. But if there's any agents out there and stuff looking for six-year-old actors, <laughs> I'm still available. I think I can still read a script. <laughs> but yeah, oh so God. I just got myself back into doing camera work and it just took off from there. In, in, in the 80s, it was a lot easier as uh, someone in their 20s um, to do freelance work because there weren't a lot of people doing that then. And there wasn't 19 ESPNs and five NBCs and six Foxes. There was just this and that. So that's where I ended up is just doing sports TV and some entertainment. And then the Barney kid came along. And how did that happen? All right. So Heather Smith and... Um, God rest her soul. She was one of the early um, ADs on Barney. Um, we had talked, and I worked with Jim Rowley um, on some other corporate stuff and everything else. And I heard about this Barney thing. Now, this was after the, the original Sandy Duncan years. This was when they were going to PBS. So this is like 91? 91, 91, yeah, 91, 92. So, um, I had heard about this and I was like, I went to Heather and I said, listen, I really think I could be I'd really be good on this show because being a former actor, I've done lighting design, set design, not like the people we had at Barney, but I did throughout high school and college. I just thought I had a good feel for how a multi-camera show would work. Um, and so, you know, she basically talked to Jim and Jim kind of knew me and I kind of went in and it wasn't like an audition, but I went in and um, the other guys were a bit more seasoned than I was, but I, I guess I did good enough to stick on the show for whatever it was, 13 years, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it was all just by determination and, and I never had run a pedestal camera in my life or worked <laughs> in a studio. No. But I just, I thought that I had the skills, you know, to work on this gig. And sure enough, it worked out. And look at all the lifelong friends and all the great memories I have from that. And I could have, I mean, I had a, um, I was doing like CBS baseball and I did the World Series in 1992. And in 93, they wanted me to come back and Barney was starting up a season. I had to make a choice between one or the other. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna stick with Barney because it's, because I had a passion for it and we're, and we're so young and so excited about it. And so I kind of gave up that whole, and not that I quit working sports, but at that point in time, I was kind of on the up and up with CBS. And I picked Barney over CBS because I was like, you know, this is something that I'll never forget and it'll last a lifetime. And here we are. Yeah. 30 years later. I, I know. I know. <laughs> what um, hey. what was it? What was it like? Well, you know, I started in 91. Yeah. Because uh, you were doing parties. Like, yeah, I was doing the yeah. parties and then the yeah. PR for them. I probably would have met you probably in 92, 93. Yeah. Uh, and then we did Radio City together, which oh yeah, uh, which I want to talk about. But 
I'm curious. We'll get to that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I want to get started on, on uh, those early days because it's something that gets asked a lot about. I mean, I remember that set very well and it, the way it was split. Uh, yeah. You had, the, you had the playground, right? Right. In the school. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, it was so tiny. What it was, was it very like tiny. Shooting and, and working on that. Well, it was so funny at Color Dynamics because we had boom mics too. We had freaking boom mics. Now, if we had pictures of how much area we had to work in, when you had boom mics take up like this gargantuan amount of space for the guy to sit up there, bring the boom in. Plus we had three cameras and a jib. I think we had a jib then. Yeah, we did. So you have all this equipment cramped in the middle of this. There's one set over here. And there's one set over there. We'd spin it around, light that one up, spin it around, light that one up. And it was just, it was tight. But we got a lot done in there. I mean, those first couple of seasons was like pretty amazing. Um, and just the camaraderie. We used to go, um, when we were all good knees and such, we'd go on the back uh, loading dock because it was still a printing company, a right. Color Dynamics. So they had a loading dock back there. and We'd all play hacky sack. And we'd have group hacky sack, what? Um, 15, 20 people. We just, bam, bam, bam. That was our lunch break. And then we get back in and do our gig. And then some of us, when the whistle blew at five o'clock, we jump in our cars and race down to Reunion Arena and do a Stars game or a Mavericks game. We were double dipping because <laughs> we needed the money. But that's, it was oh crazy God. times what we would do. And oh my gosh, long days. But when, we are, when you're young and you're making money, it was like, no worries. Next morning, get up crack a dawn, get back to the studio, do it all again. It's so funny. I, I remember when I finally got to do Hacky Sack and it was like, <laughs> you're there, right? Like you, you're part of the group. I knew all about the Hacky Sack for all. <laughs> when I finally got to do it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm part of this. I'm part of the group. We had so many great pranks back then too. All the just dumb stuff that, I mean, because we were having fun. Right. And it's a bunch of creative people that have to blow a little steam sometimes because not everything was going like their way that day. Yeah. So the hacky sack was a great thing. The other thing was the, the C-47, the clothespin trick where people would come up and clothespins in the industry, wooden clothespins are called C-47. I guess it's on some ledger where you order them from some right. company. So all over America, it's called a C-47. So we'd have them on set for, especially the lighting crew, because they'd use them for a lot on the lights. So the big trick was we'd come up behind people on set and clip these C-47s on their shirts and jackets and all over. And, and it was, it, all of a sudden they'd sit down and go, God darn it. <laughs> that was this dumbest thing, but it was so much fun. So one day, Buzz Schwing, who is our lead grip one with the lighting department. And he was like the master of it. So one day he had this Jeep. So I went out and bought like 200 C-47s, clothespins. And during lunch, I went out and I clipped them all over his Jeep. I mean, everywhere you could possibly clip them on the outside of his Jeep. And uh, so after work, you know, of course, everyone knew about it, but him. So we we're all walking out to the parking lot. He came up and just was like, are you kidding me? And I go, and that was like the end of it. That was like the ultimate, okay, you got me, we're done. But that's just kind of attitude we had back then. It was just, and we did throughout the series. I mean, we had a lot of fun. Well, the, the amount of hours that you're doing, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a yeah. Lot. And, and there could be some high pressure in times too. As you're talking about with 16 takes at times and oh yeah talking about kids too that have labor laws and so they you know oh yeah there's deadlines and school something out school and all those aspects oh. too so yeah. that one part was definitely important yeah it definitely was and yeah we get frustrated because it's like how was that out and everything's isoed and you're right. just doing a line cut right. and they're going to go back and edit everything 
but I got it because we did strive for perfection and there'd be, uh, you know, it could be with the background. There could be a bit kid in the background picking his nose and it's the perfect take. And it's like, and we as camera people go, did anyone see the kid picking his nose? Um, but that was the kind of things we had to look out for constantly. It was it just, but it made it, um, made it great. I mean, it, and it helped me, um, if you want to get to that point yet, but as a sports photographer, working on that show made me so much better because um, I understood um, framing, content. Um, you think in sports, it's just like, follow the ball, follow the ball, whatever sport it is, follow the puck. But there's a lot more to it. And if you look at the artistry and the framing and what goes on in sports, um, when it was four by three, it was different. But when it went 16 by nine, high def, you could really reimagine how you shot sports. Well, I learned that from Barney because the same thing happened. When we went from four, three Barney to 16 by nine Barney near the end, it was a whole new planet of, wow, rethought. How can we you know, set up these scenes? Look at these shots. Um, and ugh, it's the greatest thing on earth. It's like what we're doing right now. I have my phone in 16 by nine and not four by three. It's crazy, but, isn't it? That we can but I learned so much um, about shooting, doing that show, and so much from the different directors and everyone else there, the other camera guys, um, gals. Uh, it was great. Well, it's, it's interesting, you all coming from sports. <laughs> And I, I've got to think that helped in a lot of different ways because, you know, especially I'm thinking about the dinos, we have a tendency to, you know, add a jump in or add a spin in or add a movement in or something. Yeah, of yeah. Nature, which I've got to think, you know, as a sports photographer, you're kind of prepared for that a little bit, right? Yeah, because you never know. Nothing's ever going to be the same. You never know what's going to happen. But that's the whole thing about framing is as long as you think framing and we were got so good about it at Barney because um, knowing, you know, you know, Dave jumped different than you and, right. and, and Martin jumped different from you. And, but once we, you know, figured out, okay, we got this and same with the kids. I mean, it was like, I don't know. It's just crazy how, there's so much goes on that people have no clue. Um, well, yeah, just the preparation and the fact that, I mean, the, the thing too, and, and you know, I'm jumping all over the place yeah, here, but yeah. I mean, for us too, just to work on a, working with some of the best set designers, prop designers, wardrobe designers, makeup, hair. Um, it was just, you know, you were amazed by the talent you were surrounded with. And where 95% of these people were from right here in Texas. And people all over the country will always go, you guys shot that in Dallas? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we did at three different studios or quote unquote studios, but we did. And they're like, really? And I said, yeah, most of the talent, some most of the kids were from Texas, I believe, not all from DFW, but pretty much everyone in the skill positions on that show we're from this area, which is just mind boggling the talent that we had here. And you can all send me money now too for saying that. <laughs> just kidding. I'll be the first to write a check. Yeah, right. Write me a check. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Um, well, you know, there's a part for us too, and I, and I, I can speak for myself that, you know, it's intimidating because I, like I said, I've been on the road for a long time. I knew a lot of you. I'd been around the set a bunch, but, mm -hmm. and I'd worked with you several times, but um, you, th there's a, there's a comfort there, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know I can do these things because they're going to get me. Like, I don't have to say, Hey, by the way, I'm going to jump here and jump there. I'm going to do these things. Like everyone had you, whether it was the, the, you know, wardrobe, obviously Bernie wore hats and all kinds of different stuff. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the prop department, all the things that they were doing. I mean, I could go yeah. on and on, but there's such a comfort to that. Um, to oh, yeah. 
since we're going all over the place, I'm just, I'm just going to go because I always think about you when we went to Universal Studios. <laughs> I always think about you when we did that video, the Land of Make Believe. Yeah, yeah. Because that was a mixed crew. We had some people from Orlando. We did. And then, and then we brought some of the Barney people. And mm -hmm. it was one of the most difficult, one of my favorite shoots I ever did, but it was also one of the most difficult because yeah. those locations, we had to shoot it at a specific time and then we lost it. Yeah. And I remember being on that uh, that that bus. Remember that thing? It was like a trolley. Yes. We were doing wheels on the bus. And you were down there and I felt comfortable because I knew you were there. Yeah. Uh, it's as I, I mean, that was a, oh my God, that shoot was great. Uh, I, I just remember just coming up with stuff with Fred and we were pulling ladders out. We we're going, Hey, can someone get us a ladder? And I'm climbing up on a ladder with a handheld camera, trying to shoot a scene and just everything we did and how bad the weather was it was like it was so cold and those kids were just freezing we were shooting like eight o'clock in the morning and then like remember when we were out at the at the uh with the girl the mermaid and yeah over at uh, sea world yeah and she that poor thing was freezing out there they had coats on her and stuff and then we'd shoot us and keep take it off i go what a pro i can't remember her name i'm sorry but she was fantastic. All the kids were great because it was brutally cold in the mornings. Well, on, yeah, yeah on, those, on that part. But then do you remember how hot it was in some of the afternoon stuff we were doing? Yeah, it was just a this whole weird thing. The after party, though, was one of the greatest of all times. But <laughs> I don't want to because I could go into after parties on this thing for 30 minutes <laughs> for every show. Radio City Music Hall. That New York party was great. Universal was great. Um, we did a live show in Phoenix of uh, Light to Tape. Right. That was really fun and a good friend of mine. Um, so they were like, do you know any local camera guys in Phoenix? And I know guys all over, and gals all over the country. And I said, yeah, my buddy, Kerry. And he had at that time, like a five-year-old son. And so I said, hey, what about Karen? And he always gave me crap about shooting Barney. And I said, well, they called him and said, hey, would you like, to, we're shooting live in Phoenix. Would you like to work? Well, of course, like anyone else, it's like, well, am I getting paid? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> he turned out to be the biggest Barney fan on earth. He couldn't believe how cool our whole crew was that was there. Um, he, we were able to get tickets for his um, wife then and his son to sit in the audience live and i couldn't think of a, a guy that you would never have thought would never become the biggest barney fan ever just because it was like once you're part of the group and you see what it is um it, it's pretty special and people always said how do you how do you listen to i love you i love me like eight trillion times and i go well it really goes right through me because i don't i'm i'm thinking of the rhythm on with the shots and we're doing this and the, that and then at the end the whole plush thing which was an art in itself that we came up with um yeah but it's just cool how um people that would that would never think would be a well barney's stupid barney and then he's like oh my god you don't know and my son wouldn't stop talking about it because he got to see him live so that's the specialty of specialness Barney well and seeing those show you know we did Radio City together and then oh yeah and then the one you're talking about in Phoenix when you get to see the kids reactions to it yeah I, yeah I mean it you know I'd say this all the time it's changed my absolutely changed my life when you see kids sure see the I love you song uh-huh I think you know when the crew gets to see that you know you get out of the studio and you get out to see the live thing I mean if that didn't affect you you know, no. how many, what is there? 4,000, 5,000 people? At, yeah. Uh, that show, and obviously Radio City is, you know, we sold that thing out. Oh, so, several days. Yeah. yeah. And I still have friends to this day. They go, oh my God. And they always, because of their kids, and they always go, 
who was the winkster? And I said, well, it was like several people. <laughs> That's why they could pop up at different spots at the same time. But I mean, the whole thing is that, um, wow, the react you get, it was just, it's just phenomenal. I was just blessed to be on there. And um, like I said, it taught me a lot. And not just, you know, working with people, definitely. And, and having patience with people. Um, because there are times when you're uh, with you, with me, and you're like, I'm on already. Can we do this? But they're doing little rewrites at the last second, and you right. just have to, you know, chill and wait. And that's what we did. But it was it was groovy. But yeah, Universal is fun though. It was so cold. It's so funny but, you remember cold because I remember hot. <laughs> well, because you're in the suit. I'm in the suit. I'm in the suit. But I remember, oh, that scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were probably in a trailer with hot coffee and stuff. And we're out there gearing up at 6.30 in the morning with the lighting guys trying to figure out how to light it. You finally come out of your trailer. I don't think that's exactly what happened, but I, I know I wasn't there at 6.30. I don't think we had trailers. In <laughs> we didn't have trailers. <laughs> that's funny, though. We didn't have trailers. But I just remember that was such a cool event. But I remember the importance of having... Uh, having you there and having some of the crew that we thank you that you could, yeah we could just rely on you and i remember as we were doing it you you knew how to talk to me hey you want to lean a little to the left hey you want to i mean yeah you, already, you knew everything and you and fred like you said were connected on all that and i yeah. just know how you pull that off and those <laughs> sort of married times if you have someone that that doesn't i mean i understand the profession now yeah and all that but there's something about someone that's been doing that for as you said thir you know my gosh 13 14 years at that point yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's hard to believe it was 30 years when i started working on there i was a young man <laughs> um but what else was i going to say well i got tons to say i mean i don't know what kind of stories you want i mean the Josh story when he caught on fire was one of my favorites. Well, you know, we've told that story. I know, but from my perspective. Well, that's why I want to hear it. No, I want to hear it because we have never told it from someone else's perspective. All right. So anyway, we're, that's when we were in Las Colinas. Right. And so Josh is over on the left side of the set. I'm shoot, I'm usually camera one. I was on the left. So we go one, two, three, and then the jib would move in between. Right. So we basically had four cameras. So I'm closest to Josh and he's in the suit and you know, we're getting ready. And, uh, and I look at him like, is that smoke coming out of the top of his head out of the suit? And all of a sudden Josh is like, ah, ah. so we like, and I'm sure this has been told a trillion different times. Sure. It's but I just everywhere. remember jumping off headset, running over and pulling that thing off. And he was like, what the? And I was like, oh, my God. And next thing you know, we canceled the day because he needed to go get checked out because he just smelled a bunch of electrical cable right? And uh, from his fan. And that was just the weirdest thing. And then it kind of made the news somehow, I think, locally. It was like something happened at Los Colinas Studios. <laughs> I was like, how did anyone get that intel? Because it was a pretty tight-lipped area when we were doing Barney. And somehow, I, I swear it made the news, Barney caught on fire. It's like, no, he didn't. <laughs> right. Like, it, that's, that's the part that always cracks me up with that story is it gets a lot bigger. Than, no, like most stories, right? Right. Right. Uh, well, I want to, since we're on that subject, yeah, so you get to see us fall a bunch. Hopefully not, <laughs> but you did get to see that kind of thing. <laughs> You've obviously seen me <laughs> several times, and, and oh my Kyle god, and Jeff and Jeff Brooks and all of us. Oh my god, right? It's a, it's a mix, right? Because yeah, there's some amusement to it, obviously, but you all are also like, is that person okay? What is that like when all of a sudden someone disappears out of your frame? <laughs> well. It, it, you know it's it's frightening because you don't know what happened right um but <laughs> generally i mean i could almost see stuff happening it's like the way the blocking was and it was too close to like the caboose was always seemed like the caboose on the last oh set gosh. the steps there mm -hmm. and that wall right. in the park 
those seem like that because those things are blind you guys and those steps came down and there was a railing but i don't know how many times you know there would be a biff off those <laughs> those steps and then that wall it's like you run into it i mean it, it, it just you just kind of go with the flow i mean we trip over stuff right i'm trying to do a dolly move and i'd step on my camera cable and trip and <laughs> cut <laughs> sorry <laughs> Well, you know, and, you and then Brooks would give me the dirty look somehow in the uh, BJ costume. That guy, can I talk about Jeff Brooks for a minute? Please do. Oh my God. He, <laughs> that cat cracked me up and he had the greatest cackling laugh in the history of laughs. And he still does. And he's going to do it when I say this right now when he watches this. But that guy could absolutely bring a room to tears just from his laugh. And so you guys are pretty, pretty calm in the, in the costumes, but if you got Jeff going in there and you'd see that little head bobbing and stuff, and I'd sit there and walk up to him and say stuff into his fake ear, because it's a costume, right. but I'd come up and get him laughing and they would get so peed off and you know, the production people would go, what are you guys doing? It's like, just. You know, it's in between <laughs> takes, having a little laugh. And just to get him to laugh, absolutely crushed me. Well, and you know that the voices were doing it too. Well, that <laughs> especially. That's the other great thing is um, the voice thing with the comedy between, and no offense to the later voices, but Julie and Bob and, um, and Patty. Patty, thank you. Sorry, Patty. Um, oh my God. And it was, it was so funny to hear them riff. I mean, the talent of those three and those that came after, trust me. But those three had this magical little improv thing going on. Like you were in a comedy store having two drink minimum and smoking a <laughs> cigarette at the corner. It was like, who are these people? Um, and it, it was just, and it kept everything light. And a lot of times, um, no one else could hear it. We could hear it on our headsets right. on camera, but it wasn't on the PA in the studio. Right. So that would make it even better because everyone's like, what are you guys laughing at? Like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, so well, there's so many. Talk, let's talk about, because you, you kind of set this up because you were saying uh, about the, the later talents, right? That other people came on, whether it was cool yeah. or not, right? But you all set something from the beginning that went all the way to the end, right? That when people came to the show, whether it was a cast member or a crew member, they understand the importance of it. They understood, you know, what we're doing, even though we do laugh and have good times and all yeah. the things that we did. There's a, a real importance to what we do. And there's a professionalism. Oh, absolutely. Across the board. And everyone that came in kind of fit in that way. Where did that start? I mean, from you all starting back in, in 91, 92. I think so. I think um, because we kind of knew we we're into something that's going to be something. And so the professionalism was off the chart. And when you look at, I wish I could pull them out, but I have like a thing with all the crew photos through the years. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the size of the crew from season 100, Till the last season I did, I didn't finish out the end of the Barney run. But the magnitude of people is incredible. I mean, it's a hundred more, it seems like a hundred more people were on that show than from the beginning. Oh. But I think that all comes from, you know, that original um, from, you know, the three producers really said, this is something special. Um, and we, we went, okay, and we went with it. And when you saw the, the care um, of everybody that worked on the show and the, prof I mean, we're saying the word again, but I mean, how everyone was so focused is like, let's make this thing work. Let's make this something. And there was something there that it was magical. And we just, and as we'd go from show to show to show, and then we'd start figuring things out more and more. And then, they would figure out the kids better and well, which kids are better than the other kids to have on the show. I mean, I hate to say that if any of you <laughs> early kids were on that show, but 
Um, but a lot of that had to do they with learned how to work well together too, right? And their yeah. chemistry in that aspect. Yeah, exactly. And the timing and and of course you're you know you're on a budget. Right. You're under time constraints to work during the day. Like you said earlier, you know, you've got all the children labor laws that you have to deal with giving the, you know, you guys a break. Um, and so trying to get an episode in every week, because we have basically three days to do right. one show for the most part, but we could do more than three days a week. But that's, I think that was kind of the window. But I think everyone just, they bought in and I bought it and I wanted to get better and better and better. And I'd come up with better camera moves. And I, you know, the, like I was saying, and not just me, the other guys too. And we'd come up with, all right. And you'd start getting that flow of, okay, now we know how to shoot this show. Now we know. And we were on those dinky sets back there in Allen. And, and then when we went to the Las Colinas, it was like, what the? <laughs> We had like two different studios of this giant room. Um, but everything was, uh, when we did the NBC, um, was that? Yeah, Imagination Island. Imagination Island. Yeah. And that was massive because the budget was like, oh my God, we have a tulip crane and I'm up on this tulip crane doing moves and we're doing these big dollies and we're doing all this stuff. And, and the budget was like, and the, and the set people. What's a tulip crane? A tulip crane? It's yeah. like, no, oh, I'd have to show you a picture. It's basically a camera that's up on a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard camera up on a jib. It's not a little camera where this guy operating it. Right. You're actually sitting up in a chair and you have someone moving you up and down and moving you around and around. And uh, so it was really cool to have one of those. It was like, woo, we got money. <laughs> and, and, and we had choo-choo tracks. So we had dolly train, uh, dolly tracks and, it was incredible. It was like, wow, Barney's really made the big time. What was that like when you you started realizing, right, from doing the little show to all of a sudden the popularity starts coming in? Yeah. Um, I think more than the popularity, it was the meaning to when we'd have like, and you know, my God, when we'd bring people in and, um, and I, I, I never liked the word special needs, but, um, you know, people that of any age that would come in and do the meet and greets with Barney mm -hmm. and that didn't happen early on, but as Barney's, um, popularity increased, um, there was, I mean, that's what took your heart and went, wow, we are doing something special. Um, it could be a 50 year old man and, he can't even talk but he can say barney and you just go what and it would just just make you go wow this is why we do this and not one of the reasons but it's just it, it was just and you know i don't know how you can control it because those kids would come up or adults would come up and give you a hug and you would feel that real and i don't know how you could you know, contain that in there. Um, you know, that was just something that that's when I realized, oh my God, we're, we're something. <laughs> it, it, was it was unbelievable. It and you, you witnessed that a lot more than me because you would go, you know, to hospitals and, and wherever and, and to see that, I mean, it just had to make, make you feel pretty awesome. Oh, it just fuels you to. Yeah, yeah, it's a fuel to do more. It, it's it's incredible. Yeah. Radio City, we got to talk some Radio City. Uh oh. I, well, I, I feel like it was the. I really remember you remember <laughs> going there. That's when I learned about the actor aspect. I I learned a lot. And oh, because I'd say, was, oh, I used to live here in New York as an actor, <laughs> the Upper West Side. I don't know if you the said Cold it like Water that, Flat. But... <laughs> Something like that. I was a bike messenger scariest job in new york that was probably my second time in new york wow and it was definitely my first time at radio city yeah definitely my first time at riga royale i don't think i'd ever stayed at a hotel like that oh that was pretty nice and that's when i really launched onto all of you 
I think that's where, I mean, we were kind of this one big team going into this because, yeah. And, you know, I've talked to Dennis DeShazer about this and, you know, the Grammys was just coming out and here we're coming, we're coming in after that production. And that was crazy. We worked with the union before union won there. And, oh my God. It was awesome. You know, all of that <laughs> stuff is incredible. And, and It'd make my you know, job easier. Well, and you know, we've never, we never got a full rehearsal. We never actually ran that show all the way through. No, 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 no time ace. It's like, this is what here's your window get her done oh and by the way i'm sorry about the elephant smell <laughs> well we talked about that elephant were you around when he, when he got loose yes <laughs> that was crazy that whole show i mean you know it's the dumbest thing the after party was one of the best ever and that's when jeff Ayers got engaged to mrs Ayers. But my favorite thing was, so the Grammys are going on and I get in an elevator and it's Brian freaking Wilson. Oh, wow. And he's got a guy with him. Door on, door closed. And I've, I've had that several times, but to me, Brian Wilson is one of my most, I don't know, favorite musicians, top five. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm looking at him. He's kind of like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, uh, great. Brian, how are you? <laughs> I just stared at him. And then it was my floor and I got off and I couldn't say anything to him. I was like, am I an idiot? <laughs> anyway, sorry to digress off the Barney no. Radio City, but that was one of those moments in my life. I'm like, it's Brian freaking Wilson. Oh my God. And I can't say anything. Love your music, dude. <laughs> what are you yeah. going to say? Mine for that trip. I was in the in the in the lobby bar mm -hmm. and sitting there is Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. I remember this story. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, are you? I mean, I've never been to, like this is all new to me. This is every <laughs> aspect of I mean, like yeah. that just doesn't happen. <laughs> just like no big deal, you know. Just I think we said oh, hello no. or something, they said hello back, and it, you know. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I don't know what it is. I'm such a, and I've been around, like we all have tons of celebrities. And sometimes you just lock up and you're like, uh, and they're just normal people. <laughs> it's just like you go, uh, but sometimes you strike up a conversation and there you go. <laughs> but you're a celebrity in your own right. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm just, I still think of myself as a big purple dinosaur, I think. I think I'm just cool. a singer in a rock and roll band. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what were your, what was your, do you have uh, a favorite moment from New York, from Radio City? Um, honestly, it was just, I thought, you know, Bruce Deck did such a great job in, in how they scripted it out and how we did the multiple shows, but we, how we layered the shots. So in the end, um, I thought his preparation was so good um, because it's hard to do. I mean, when it's one thing when you're in a studio and you do a trillion takes, but like you said, where you're doing a live show and yet you're gonna, the show's gonna be the same, but how we shoot it is gonna change every time. So it was good to have that. We had these shot sheets like shot 54, 55, and how you normally shoot a, a live show is that's what they do. The, the AD calls out a shot number. And then, and I've done entertainment like that too. And they call out a shot number, you know, like shot 54 is a two shot of this shot. And then it's the other camera, other camera, then your shot 58 is a three shot of this. And so we did, a, I thought they did a great job of, um, they kept it fresh. So we weren't shooting the same thing every how i don't even know how many shows we did three and a matinee four i don't even know sometimes it's a blur oh i know well i talk about this on the t i don't remember everything I, we did but, 12 shows i know that <laughs> but it was radio city musical right and i remember my dad used to take all of his kids to new york when they're like 12 or 13 for like the new york trip Mm -hmm. that was the first time you do the circle line tour go to statue of liberty our state building yada 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 well 
I remember he took me to the Rockettes because it was like Christmas. Well, it's winter or whatever. It was pre-Christmas, but they performed for like a month. Right. And I just remember going there and uh, and seeing the Rockettes and it's Radio City Music Hall. And you're like, oh my God. Even at 13 years old, you knew what it was. Right. How famous it was. And just the marquee outside, you walk up to it. And when you saw Barty live, on the marquee that was like what really it's so cool um there was just so many great aspects but yeah it was fun it was, was definitely the, fun uh, the differences on the three sets for you going from allen to las Colinas to carrollton carrollton marsh lane i called it there you go marsh lane which was a, a because a once hit once hit took over you know, which is a British company, right? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I got you. they always call their studios after the street they're named on. Like, look at Abbey Road. I mean, that's what they do in England. I'm yeah. sorry, England, I might be wrong, but they always name their studios like whatever the street is. So I'd always call it Marsh Lane in homage. I love it. But um, I would say, you know, Las Colinas was so big and we had so much space now they were also shooting other things in there not often but there was just so much room that we had the massive school room and then we had the massive whatever playground thing and then we could build a whole nother thing and it's like imagination island we just like built a jungle in there and then when we did the the ship the ship was incredible having that ship in there you couldn't do it anywhere else in Dallas you had to have Las Colinas um but yeah and then Marsh Lane was nice and the good thing was across the street was a diamond store where I went over one day and got my engagement ring from my wife <laughs> so it made it convenient <laughs> that was 17 years ago 16 years ago wow Time yeah flies. it does but I, yeah, Las Colinas was, and what's so funny is none of them were easy to get to from where I lived at the time. <laughs> it's about commuting, and I'm like, I hate commuting. Well, in the hour, you're in the middle of traffic, weren't you? Uh, yeah. But, you know, it was just long days, but it was all good. I mean, they all had their own unique uh, personalities, the sets, and again, that's, that's, totally to the set designers and the lighting designers and um how they made those spaces work and but yeah you know you love the old allen color dynamics just because it was so tight and even where we ate like the catering i mean we were all tight in there eating it was like it was just funny it, it felt like that's the way this thing grew it went from this to wait, I gotta lean back this and then kind of went back to that. Well, and I, I gotta get your perspective here. So Marsh Lane, obviously, uh Demi Lovato and Selena Gomez came Yeah. Out yeah. And I've always said we all kind of knew Selena. Yeah. And Demi, which is um I I gotta get all this right, but I kind of trying to remember which kid my brother worked at a car dealership i don't think it was demi it was another girl that was on the show and he knew her father worked at this car dealership and so he'd come and drop her off but it wasn't demi god I, there's so many kids it blows through your mind right. but i do remember both the demi and selena and they were the same thing i'd walk up and there was i'd go hey because i could tell they kind of had it a little bit well, all the kids had it Right. But you could tell, and I'd come up and do the same thing I do to you. And of course, behind the everyone else's back, and I'd say, "Hey, you need to open up more when you're, you know, because you're going to be on camera too." Remember, don't look at the lens, but that's your camera, so open up. And then when, if you know, this person's talking to your left, and she would, it was like that. I mean, Selena was like, "Boom, got it, okay." And Demi was too. Um, they were they were they were pretty good. 
I have to say, but most of the kids were very receptive when you'd, you'd come up and say stuff and kids are kids. I mean, sometimes in, when they're waiting and waiting to do a take and you're sitting there waiting and waiting to do a take because they're right. going over stuff and they're going to lose their concentration. It was so hard. So you try to interact with them and have a little fun and, or I'd let them come over and run the camera. And that was always kind of fun. And then it would be like, hey, don't let the kid run the camera. They're going to concentrate. I'm kidding. They never did that. <laughs> it wasn't a unique gig, so there was no nothing broken there with them running no. camera. But it was always fun too with teaching the kids what we were doing and have them come behind the camera and they could see what we we're I'm like here. This is what we're looking at. I look like Fred now. Fred, if you ever watch these things. But um, you know, just teaching them how to understand the scope of what's going on with especially the cameras. Right. It's crazy. And y'all figured it out quickly. I'm trying to look at that picture behind your right shoulder. That's a playground set. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, I think I have that. Oh. I, I yep. th There's those kids right there. Yeah, there they are. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I have so many great photos from back then. I, the memories are just amazing favorite memory or favorite couple memories i guess first my first favorite memory is getting the gig and uh somehow talking my way onto that show and because i had the backing of um not just heather but uh the other camera people bruce Deck, who did lighting i mean people that knew me and said hey and jim riley kind of knew me um and um, I think Charlotte Spy was there then, so she knew me in the beginning. So I did have that backing because um, they were like, who is this guy? Who's this long haired hippie wants to run camera? Um, but that's that's got to be, honestly, that show meant the world to me. And it helped me buy a house. <laughs> you know, because in the end, cash is king. Right. Um, and we do this to make a living right uh even though we love it and i don't know i mean the other memories it's it's spread out over all the the, the live shows really um imagination island though was pretty much up there too just because we had all the toys and the budget was like and so we had all this time and all these cameras that we could do all this stuff with and the sets were amazing um everything about that was great but i think all the live stuff and then, of course, anytime you had a meet and greet, that, that again, I mean, I can't even say that without getting a tear because it just went, wow, we're doing something pretty damn cool here. Sorry, darn, darn. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> and then I, I got to ask real quick because we didn't really get to it, but what are you doing now? I know you've been still doing sports. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've been at. So I got employed by ESPN Disney like seven years ago. Um, they decided to take on um, technical people as employees. I don't know if it was an IRS thing or something, but they decided to bring in a lot of us, which is great. So I mostly do ESPN, ABC. I do get to do occasional local work here like Rangers during the summer, because that's kind of my downtime for ESPN. But I just finished 16 years on Monday Night Football. Wow. Yeah. And then I, well, and even when I was doing Barney, I'd started doing Fox football in 94. And I was doing CBS before that. So I've always, um, that was another crazy thing too, was back when I was young and single, I could do Barney during the week. And then on the weekends, I could travel for whatever network and do sports and come back and do Barney. And then, and I work my butt off. Um, but why not? The work was there. So I do that. And I basically, I do um, NBA for ESPN. So I've done the finals five or six years with them. So it's pretty that? cool. And then all this other random stuff. What's that? How's that? That's be oh, it's awesome. It's, you know, it's such a big stage. 
and I grew up in Milwaukee, basically, um, before I moved here in 1980. So I was always a Bucks fan. So last year, it was cool. I was able to do the Bucks win in the NBA championship in Milwaukee, which was like, cool. I'm still, I'm a Mavs fan to people, but, you know, I always think I'm a Packer fan. Sorry. Look at the green. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I think we've discussed that in the past. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, I care for <laughs> but, another team. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, people. I'm just not a cowboy fan. I don't. I don't dislike any teams except for the Bears. Let me put it that way. I don't dislike the Cowboys. I'm just. I'm a Packer fan. It's the only sport I really like. Stick to one team. But other than that, it's just like yeah. My wife and I travel a lot. Well, we did pre-COVID. Right. Done some amazing trips across the globe. So that's that's kind of our passion. But ever since the COVID hit, that kind of kibosh that. Well, in fact, we were supposed to go to Italy um, right after COVID hit. And so we had to cancel all that. But we enjoyed doing that. You did the bubble, though, didn't you? The NBA? Oh, I did the NBA bubble. 97 days in the bubble. Wow. Um, yeah, that was something. My wife is the best because she had to put up with because you're going to have visitors. Um, we were able to get out, go to the store, do stuff like that until the finals. But 97 days away from home in the same hotel room is pretty crazy. Um, it was crazy. But the NBA did it right because not one player and not one person working there ever contracted COVID so it worked wow yeah and I fly a lot as you know so yeah. the mask thing to me is so secondary it's like I'm surprised I'm not wearing one right now <laughs> I guess so you're right Bouvet it's just I feel like I could just keep talking to you all afternoon no I know we could and hopefully you'll edit most of the stuff out when I said bad things about um <laughs> Bob West and Patty and <laughs> I couldn't remember Patty's name. So horrible. We're friends on Facebook and I couldn't remember her name. <laughs> so many people to remember. But I no, I mean, I have so many great memories and, you know, I miss everybody. And We used to have so many great happy hours <laughs> I at know. the end of the week. Sorry, <laughs> kids that are watching this, but this crew had to unwind sometimes and we would go out, just have so many laughs and just enjoy each other's company away from it, it, it. Yeah. Was there stress involved with the job? Sure. There are deadlines, there are things, but honestly, it was some of the best days of my life. And my feet would be killing me at the end of the day. And it's same with you and same with everybody else. But in the end, was it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on. You're welcome. And thank you for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week.